Καλή το Προεδρείο. Ευχαριστώ για την ιδιαίτερη τιμητική πρόσκληση και τον καθηγητή τον κύριο Φιλιπάτο, αλλά φυσικά και τον Γρηγόρη. Και θα το γυρίσω τώρα στα αγγλικά και εγώ, μια και έχουμε και Άγγλου μαζί και ξένου. Λοιπόν, bon, dear ladies and gentlemen, we change to the English language and we move on. And first of all, I would like to welcome you uh, all to Greece. Uh, I will uh, talk about the basic elements of coronary microcirculation. I have no conflicts of interest. So this is going to be practically the way I'm going to approach the subject. And we will start a little bit about the anatomy. What we know already is the fact that myocardial uh, oxygen extraction is near maximal at rest. So myocardial oxygen delivery is almost completely dependent on coronary blood flow. Consequently, an increase in myocardial oxygen demand must be matched by a proportional increase in coronary blood flow to prevent myocardial ischemia. And this is well known for many years now. About the coronary microcirculation, as you can see, we have the epicardial arteries. So there is a small, let's say, debate. What's the cutoff uh, where we set about microcirculation and epicardial vessels? It might be 400 micrometers. It might be 500 micrometers. However, usually it's about uh, 400. And as you can see, when we go to a smaller size vessels, uh, like the pre-arterioles and arterioles and the capillaries, this is the site that we have the regulation of flow resistance and thus perfusion. This eventually leads to this microcirculation to be the business end of the circulation, supplying oxygen and nutrients to the tissue, removing waste products and controlling inflammation and repair, as well fluid exchange with the tissue. There is uh, several mechanisms that have been uh, proposed about the work uh, of the coronary microcirculation. And we know that every vessel responds either to local hemodynamic signals like wall shear stress, transmolar pressure, or circumferential wall stress, to metabolic signals, and also to signals transmitted via upstream signal conduction through gap junctions in the vessel wall, and downstream via convection of signal substances with the flowing blood. The tone regulation and the remodeling of the arteries in the microcirculation play a, a very important role in uh, the microcirculatory function. And therefore, there are several changes that are either structural and typically, typically affect smaller sized microvessels, 40 to 100 micrometers, that regulate vascular tone in response to intraluminal pressure changes and can be explored with endothelium dependent vasodilators such as adenosine. However, there are also functional changes that include impaired vasodilation due to endothelial dysfunction or hypersensitivity to vasoconstrictor. These changes primarily affect larger size microvessels, 100 to 400, in which regulation of vascular tone in a, is endothelium dependent and can be explored ma mainly with acetylcholine testing. As we have already seen, and whoever has open, uh, opened Coroventis can see it every day, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And unfortunately, there is no available technique that can visualize in vivo the coronary microcirculation. What's the pathophysiology of coronary microvascular dysfunction? Unfortunately, when we have coronary microvascular dysfunction, uh, this leads to attenuation of coronary flow augmentation in response to stress. And if severe enough, this can lead to demand supply mismatch that may lead to subclinical or clinical myocardial ischemia. Coronary microvascular dysfunction occurs as a consequence of these functional alterations and structural alterations or a combination of both. As you can see on the right side, these structural, these structural mechanisms affect Abnormal vascular, the abnormal vascular remodeling that we can see either by uh, smooth muscle cell proliferation and activation, perivascular fibrosis and microvascular inflammation. There can be luminal obstruction with intravascular plugging and vascular wall infiltration such in cardiomyopathies like amyloidosis or Fabry disease. Capillary refraction where we have a reduced density, a reduced diameter and lumen obstruction and also extrinsic vascular compression like we can see in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and amyloidosis. And of course, as mentioned before, we also have functional mechanisms like endothelial dysfunction and hyperreactivity. And as you can see, these are primarily mediated through several 
uh, biochemical uh, mediators like NO, uh, endothelin, and uh, reactive oxygen species. Except from stable angina and stable patients, we have also coronary microvascular obstruction and dysfunction in uh, patients that come with STEMI in the cath lab. Unfortunately, despite prompt epicardial recanalization in patients with STEMI, coronary microvascular obstruction and dysfunction is still fairly common and is associated with poor prognosis. As you can see, these are the main mechanisms that, uh, evolve, that involve endothelial blebs, myocardial swelling, endothelial damage linking to intramyocardial hemorrhage, interstitial edema, vasospasm, distal embolization, and platelet leukocyte plugs that lead to this image in the end that it's not very good uh, for the prognosis of the patient. Unfortunately, so far we have no real treatment for this microvascular obstruction happening during the uh, course of a STEMI patient. We have shown uh, earlier that we can estimate microvascular obstruction uh, through IMR and also with microvascular obstruction obtained through CMR. And we have shown that when we can assess microvascular dysfunction, either by using the IMR and a cutoff value of over 40, and we assess also CMR assessed MVO, we can see that there is an increase about four times of adverse outcomes in the future. This also was done with a slightly different method that involved assessment of the angiography and not of real wire assessment of microvascular dysfunction. But even in this case, this coronary angiography-based IMR was predictive of future cardiovascular events. One other issue is that coronary microvascular dysfunction can lead to multiple diseases. It's not only about microvascular angina or microvascular obstruction. As you can see, it has been related to HFPEF, to obstructive CAD, to Takotsubo syndrome, to Inoka, Minoka, and of course to cardiomyopathies. And in most of these cases, it has been shown that it has also a prognostic role. And that makes it very important to assess, not only in patients that we don't find anything in the coronary arteries, but also in other cases like patients with heart failure or even in cases with cardiomyopathies that could show us their prognosis if we assess them at baseline. Microvascular dysfunction, it's not just in the coronaries. It's more a systemic disease. And this has been shown by several studies that have assessed microvascular dysfunction in other territories like the brain or the kidney and in the retina. And it has been shown that there is an association between the microvascular dysfunction that we observe in the coronaries and the microvascular obstruction we assessed, for example, in the brain or in the kidney. And this is important because the prognosis is not only from the heart that we can assess with microvascular dysfunction, but maybe from another organ. If, for example, we see a patient that has microvascular dysfunction in the heart, that might imply that he might have an increased risk of uh, having a, a stroke or even of uh, having Alzheimer's disease. And this would be important to know since we have this information available. One of my main interests of research in the past it was erectile dysfunction. And in a nature review that we had recently, we showed that erectile dysfunction, but also all, of, all these other diseases have microvascular dis dysfunction in the middle, in the center, causing them and leading to these diseases in most of the cases. Not as a sole player, but one of the contributors. Regarding treatment, things are not looking very bright. Over the past three decades, there have been multiple studies done, especially on microvascular angina. And unfortunately, so far, no treatment is available. Even some newer treatments with endothelin antagonists, which was recently uh, uh, published, didn't show that had any benefit in patients with microvascular angina. However, we are still expecting results from newer treatments like rokinase inhibitors, the reducer had some initial uh, positive results or even cell and gene therapy. However, so far, unfortunately, we don't have any other than the basic treatments that we use in patients with angina. And based on the pattern of the angina, we can choose the right agent to give. 
Treatment of coronary microvascular dysfunction and obstruction in STEMI patients, again, has not find, found any real solution. And despite the efforts that have been done, either by use of fibronolytics, vasodilators, PIXO or deferred standing, there is no uh, definite uh, basis on a treatment that we can use in these patients. To conclude, coronary microvascular dysfunction plays a pathophysiological role in various cardiovascular states, influencing ischemic manifestations, symptoms, and prognosis, but its molecular, functional, and structural mechanisms have not been fully clarified. Various non-invasive and invasive techniques can be used to evaluate coronary microvascular dysfunction in clinical practice, each of which have strengths and limitations and will be colorfully presented by the following uh, speakers. A better understanding of the pathophysiology of uh, coronary uh, microvascular dysfunction is needed to develop therapeutic strategies that ameliorate angina and improve long-term prognosis. Thank you very much. Συγχαρητήρια κύριε Τερντέ και για την παρουσίαση αλλά και το ερευνητικό έργο που έχει κάνει πάνω στο θέμα αυτό. Ε, μια παρατήρηση. Ε, νομίζω δείχτηκε σε, δικό, σε δική σας διαφάνεια αλλά κυκλοφορεί ότι η α, επικαρδιακή κυκλοφορία είναι υπό πολλαπλάσια της μικροκυκλοφορίας. Ε, αλλά η προσοχή που δίνουμε είναι αντίστροφη. Όλη η επεμβατική καρδιολογία α, που αφορά τα στεφανία κάνει φόκο στην επικαρδιακή και αγνοούμε ή σε πολύ μικρό ποσοστό ασχολούμαστε με την μικροκυκλοφορία. Μήπως πρέπει να αλλάξει αυτό. We should focus also on the small vessels. Unfortunately, the problem is that we cannot treat what we cannot see. And if we cannot see it, we don't have a way to treat it. The coronaries, the epicardial coronaries are there. You can see they are narrowed. You will put a stand and you will fix them. However, we need to have more research on the microvasculatory in order to get the data and also the treatments that are necessary. Because about one out of three patients with microvascular angina with, uh, with angina have microvascular angina and these patients might benefit from such treatment. So, um, I'm going to talk in English. So, beautiful overview, clear overview. Um, two comments and um, so the first one is about, uh, you said we don't have a real treatment. And I mean, this is actually the argument of a lot of colleagues who say, why measure it? We can't treat it anyhow. Uh, here, um, I'm not sure I agree. Uh, I think it's really important to understand the Inoka endotypes. And there are studies actually who show that knowing the endotype, right, um, and choosing from the limited, as you said, arsenal of medication or novel uh, therapies. Uh, I was involved in the reducer for microvascular angina, um, and we're still going on, uh, and we're going to uh, see this. But however, that it in increases uh, quality of life, right? Uh, decreases angina uh, frequencies. Um, and obviously, the big question is about prognosis, right? Uh, where uh, research will focus. Uh, what is your take on this first comment? Thank you very much for an excellent comment. I agree. We've seen from the Cormica trial that when we identify the exact pattern of disease, we can uh, guide treatment either with beta blockers or nitrates, uh, depending on the and on the type of uh, disease. You're totally correct, and I totally agree. However. These treatments are the ones that we have already in our arsenal. So if we found, for example, I was talking about rectal dysfunction. No one was speaking about rectal dysfunction until 1999 when Sidelafid went out. After that, there was a burst of research, a burst of interest, a burst of everything. So if there is a way to target it directly, we might have this kind of burst. But until then, yes, we should look ver further into this research because it's very important and because patients, although there is no treatment, there are the patients. Patients are there with symptoms and we need to make them better. Do I have time for another short course, comment? Yes, okay. Uh, because it's uh, one of my interests, it's myocardial infarction uh, and uh, microvascular obstruction. As you said, 50% of patients have this. 
Uh, it correlates very much uh, the indices with uh, uh, size of infarct, right, as we see in MRI and prognosis, right? That's what we know. Um, now, um, what, and I, I just, probably it's, you don't need to comment if you, if you don't, but our, our thinking was at some point that maybe uh, sufficient and effective platelet inhibition early on will decrease microvascular obstruction. Um, one study which I was involved um, and used uh, crushed tablets in the ambulance in patients who would then uh, get primary PCI didn't show, and we didn't go directly to measure uh, uh, resistance indices, uh, but we looked at blush, right, indirectly for microvascular. I understand there are limitations to this. However, now we have um, GPI inhibitors, subcutaneous, which we are giving now, and the study is uh, running right now uh, as we're talking uh, in the Netherlands and in Poland, and we're gonna see. Do you think that early platelet inhibition, which might block you know, the, the, the embolization, right, thrombotic embolization maybe, uh, or the leukocyte platelet plugging as you, uh, and uh, which also causes inflation, will help in this area? So, first of all, I like the question. Second, you asked me to gamble and see whether I will be right or wrong. I, I'm not sure. I, I have some doubts based on the, on the time trial that uh, they gave the fibronolytics, they gave it based on IMR, and unfortunately, they didn't show any benefit. I hope that this might work, but I think it's a multifactorial problem that I'm not sure just the GP. 2B3A will be the only solution. So we need to have some kind of vasodilatory effect. We need to have some antiplatal effect, antithrombotic effect. I don't know what the treatment might be. The mechanical treatment like Pixot never worked. For example, I think the company is closing down now. So I hope that this might be the case, but I think we should look into it and continue searching the right way to treat it. With this, congratulations for this very insightful uh, presentation. I will ask a Final question, uh, Dr. Triadis. Θα επιμείνω λίγο στο, στο, στο microvascular injury, στο STEMI, γιατί είναι ένα σημαντικό κομμάτι του microvascular dysfunction που πολλέ φορέ uh, δεν το συζητάμε όσο πρέπει. Εσεί, κύριε Τριάδη, είστε ένα πολύ εμπειρό σε εμβατικό σκαρδιολόγιο και κάνει πάρα πολλά περιστατικά. Πώ αντιμετωπίζετε στην καθημερινή σα πράξη τον όριφλο όταν έχετε, τι θα κάνετε. Ξέρουμε τι ακαδημαϊκέ συζητήσει ότι δεν υπάρχουν αποδεδειγμένε θεραπείε, αλλά εσεί πρακτικά τι κάνετε. Είμαστε, Είμαστε σε αδιέξοδο στο θέμα αυτό. Γι' αυτό το λόγο ε, προσπαθήσαμε και προμεθευτήκαμε και ευχαριστούμε την εταιρεία που μας έδωσε την πλατφόρμα της Κοροβέντης για να μπορέσουμε να μας βοηθήσει να επιλύσουμε κάποια θέματα που αφορούν όχι μόνο στη μέτρηση του FFR ή του IFR αλλά να μετρήσουμε και τις αντιστάσεις και να προσφέρουμε κι εμείς κάτι ή να μας βοηθήσει σε πρακτικό επίπεδο και αναμένουμε και τη συμβολή σας σε αυτό. Ε, είχαμε χρησιμοποιήσει παλιά και υπάρχει μια μικρή δημοσίευση, όχι δεν διεκδικεί δάφνε με τον κύριο Σιόνι, διάλειμμα αδρεναλίνης. Ένα προς δέκα και πάλι ένα προς δέκα. Ε, μήπως με την έκπληση, την ταχεία έκπληση, ε, έκπληση ε, αναταχθεί. Ε, δεν νομίζω ότι διεκτικοί επιστημονικές δάχνες σε κάποιες περιπτώσεις, αφού είχαμε χρησιμοποιήσει η διαδημοσύνη ε, που δεν απέδωσε, σε κάποιες περιπτώσεις απέδωσε. Προς το παρόν νομίζω ότι υπάρχει μάλλον αδιέξοδο και πολύ ερευνητικό ενδιαφέρον. Βεβαίως, ε, έχουν εισέλθει στην ε, φαρέτρα μας και όπλα. Τώρα κάποια από αυτά εγκρίθηκε για τα Στεφανία που αφορά στην αφαίρεση του θρόμου, γιατί ο μηχανισμός του Νόου Ριφλό, όπως ξέρετε, είναι ε, πολύ παραγωγικός. Ε, όπως γίνεται στον εγκέφαλο, να γίνει και στα Στεφανία με την συσκευή Envast, να αφαιρέσουμε μεγάλη ποσότητα θρόμου, ώστε να αποκτήσουμε με αυτό ήδη μια τιμή δύο ροή και να φύγουμε από τιμή μηδέν. Α, πράγμα. Ο επόμενος ομιλητής θα ήταν ο κύριος Δημητριάδης, ο, ο επίκολος καθηγητής πρόσφατα εκλεγής. Δεν μπορεί να έρθει, μας ενημέρωσε και 